there are some things that you really need to understand if you want to effectively outreach to Jehovah's Witnesses. And that's what I'm gonna share with you today. I'm really gonna give you in this video two major things that I shared recently at a conference up in Sacramento, the Witnesses for Jesus Now conference. I'll put the link for the website for that conference in the video description. But I'd like to give you the same content here on my YouTube channel because I really think it's gonna effectively change the way that you outreach to Jehovah's Witnesses. So first step, we need to stop and ask what it's like to be a Jehovah's Witness. So I would like to give you an inside look, um, uh, basically to give your, yourself a, um, a heart of compassion for the witness to not just see them as an opponent of the gospel, but see them as the target of the gospel. But then I want to give you some really practical tips. This will be the last part of how you can effectively outreach to them because it's a little overwhelming when you start to reach out to a uh, different religious group and you realize there's a ton of information to deal with. So I, I have some simple tips that I think will really help you to be more effective in your witnessing. All right, well, let's jump into the content. Uh, first step, let's find out what it's like to be a Jehovah's Witness. The first thing you'll notice is there's obviously um, theological issues. There are theological issues when you are dealing with Jehovah's Witnesses. And what I mean here is that everything, and I mean everything, essential in the Christian faith is twisted and adulterated in Jehovah's Witness teaching. So if you were Jehovah's Witness, then everything you've heard about God, about the Trinity, about Jesus, about salvation, about the Bible, um, about other Christians in the world, uh, everything you've heard has been twisted, most likely from birth. Because a lot of Jehovah's Witnesses, they were raised in it. They were brought up as JWs from the beginning. So they've never heard otherwise. Now others, they've been brought into the Jehovah's Witness uh, religion, but they were brought into it from a nominal stance in another religion, meaning they didn't really know Christianity very well. They were kind of heard about it, but it weren't really indoctrinated or educated, really given teaching from the theology of Christianity. So their, their theological makeup is entirely Jehovah's Witness. This causes lots of problems. Um, it's, it's difficult when everything you've heard about the Trinity has been a twisted thing. Everything you've heard about salvation has been twisted from the beginning. All your thinking is a little bit messed up in this area. So I know personally of Jehovah's Witnesses who've, who've, uh, who've told me that after coming out of the Watchtower, it took them years and years and years to try to unravel all of the twisting that had been done of theology. It really takes... It takes them to a new place of confusion when they realize that the Watchtower has not been giving them the truth. And they realize that their representations of the Trinity were false and their representations of Christianity were not accurate. Um, their representations of, of the Bible were not true. Man, it's, it's, a, it's a tangled web of deceit that they have to then try to untangle slowly. It's not just like a light switch goes on and now everything's clear. It's rather quite difficult and quite laborious to work through it all for them. Hopefully that causes your heart to go out to them a little bit. But it's worse than that because, and here's the thing that a lot of people don't realize with Jehovah's Witnesses. There are sociological issues. There is the whole society issues. This is what makes the Watchtower not, not just a false religion, but a mind and life controlling social group that has rules and structures that are formatted to basically lock the members in. And this is why when people leave the watchtower, they, they, they say things like, I've escaped. Like, I didn't just leave, I escaped or I woke up. Um, there's a, a, a YouTube channel called Locked in the Tower because that's how they feel they were up until that time when they escaped this societal conditioning that's gone on. So let me give you an example of some of the things that uh, average Jehovah's Witness experiences. Um, for one, if you were raised as a Jehovah's Witness or you've been, you've been brought into it uh, at a later time in life, your entire social circle, most likely, are all Jehovah's Witnesses. They're all Jehovah's Witnesses with, with the same false theology and with all of the same lingo and, you know, you, you know, the same phraseologies and stuff like that that come into it. Rules for how you live your life way beyond Christianity. Rules for how they live their lives are, are structured and given from above, from the governing body, and they are to follow these rules. The, uh, the only way to survive doomsday that's coming imminently at any moment is to be part of God's organization. Not, not have faith in Jesus. No, be part of the Jehovah's Witness organization. So their commitment to this organization is, is paramount. That's the number one thing. The biggest thing is the governing body and yielding and submitting to them. And so there can even be a um, almost a superstitious fear at the idea of questioning or, 
or doubting the governing body that, that has to be overcome. All their social circle, circle, again, they're Jehovah's Witnesses. But what's worse is if you ever leave the watchtower, your social circle abandons you. Family, friends, coworkers, whoever, if they're JWs, they abandon you. They shun you. There's actually a doctrine called shunning that they'll put into practice. Also, the watchtower causes them to be extremely busy. There's a lot of busyness that goes on and a lot of suspicion they have towards those outside the circle. So you start to see that this is a small circle that you're involved in and there's all these like layers of um, barriers that are keeping you from the outside group. In fact, in all reality, the purpose of the shunning doctrine to shun those who leave isn't to harm the people who leave. It's to, it's to keep the people in locked in. The shunning is actually worse for those who stay in rather than it is for those who go out, although it emotionally harms them. Um, I actually did an interview not too long ago on my YouTube channel of a Jehovah's Witness, a former Jehovah's Witness couple named Simon and Maria. They have their own YouTube channel. I'd encourage you to check it out. Just Simon and Maria is the name of it. But I asked them the question, how busy were you as a result of being a Jehovah's Witness? What was your weekly schedule typically like? And I think you'll find it very insightful to uh, hear what they said about that. So here's a little uh, quote from that interview. Hours a week, would you say, were spent on average in your life uh, going to meetings, preparing for meetings, going to, door to door, that sort of thing? Wow. Well, you took <clears throat> everything all combined. Yeah. Okay, all things wow. that were, you know, specifically, these are practices I do just because I'm a Jehovah's Witness. Like, nobody else will be doing this. Well, okay, I'll tell you, when I first, when I first became a Jehovah's Witness, I'll tell you how much I did. Um, because that was when it was the, when we were the most active in the sense of there was a lot of things to do. You had your Sunday meet. You had your, so we started with Monday. So mo Tuesday we had a meeting. So Monday we prepared for the Tuesday, which could take a couple of hours. So you could do a couple of hours on a Monday. Then you had a two-hour meeting on a Tuesday. So you got four hours already. Mm -hmm. Then on a Wednesday, you'd be preparing for your Thursday meeting, which could take a couple of hours. And the Thursday meeting was an hour. So what are you on, two, four, six, seven hours, is that right? So I'm already on seven hours now, and I've got to Thursday. Mm -hmm. And then Friday is like family worship, because you've got to have a, so you say an hour, so seven, you're on eight now, eight hours. Saturday you do at least minimum an hour on field service, knocking on doors. Mm -hmm. So that's nine hours. And Sunday you've got a two-hour meeting, so that's 11 hours. Mm -hmm. But not only that, you would also... Normally, a lot of us, because we work with our hands, a lot of, you find a lot of Jehovah's Witnesses are laborers. Uh, they, they look down on education, you see. So that a lot of them are window cleaners, carpet cleaners, and plumbers, etc. A lot of them have one day off a week, and they've gone to ministry, they probably do a couple of hours. So I would say probably between 13 and 14 hours per week minimum. Yeah, and that's not as a notable volunteer for the Kingdom Hall in some sense. It's just, this is just standard. Right. Yeah, that's pretty much That's pretty much it. And that doesn't include going to work. Yeah. <laughs> so you can see that there's, there's some real uh, busyness. Um, imagine if you're Jehovah's Witness and you do start to doubt, uh, how do you even find time to study, <laughs> to research into the deep issues and the tough subjects that come up when you start to doubt. I want to look at the history of the Watchtower. I want to go deep into theology so I can make sure that what I believe is true. When you're just, you're so busy, you're, you're working full time uh, because of the uh, suspicious attitude that Jehovah's Witnesses are told to have towards education. Most of them are laborers. So they're working lo long hours and then they come home and then they have preparation and study and then going out and witnessing and things like this. Now, not every Jehovah's Witness is seven days a week, like this couple was at least for a season. Um, but it would make things difficult. And your social circle then, seven days a week, you're involved with this thing. So it's it's entirely Jehovah's Witness. So leaving, stepping away from the watchtower, it can be very difficult, uh, very challenging for them. Uh, I have one more clip, I'll, or two more actually. I want to share a clip from the same interview with Simon and Maria. And what they shared here, I thought was really insightful. And for those who've never been in the watchtower, never been Jehovah's Witnesses, you need to hear this from their lips because it helps you understand when that person knocks on your door, right? They're not just like, oh, here they come. I'm going to get them. I'm so sick, to be honest, of the comments on one of my videos where people think of clever, mean things to say to Jehovah's Witnesses instead of having a heart of compassion for them, right? We're on a rescue mission, not a search and destroy mission. <laughs> and so as Christians, we've got to uh, uh, gain this heart of compassion. So um, one of the targets of this video is give you a heart of compassion, but then I want to give you a mind of wisdom so you know how to 
how to interact with them better as well uh, in, a, in an effective way. So here we go. Let, let's look at this next clip and see what we can learn from it. And that's what caused me to start doubting, you know, then I started to do my research. And you're not allowed to do independent research. Mm. You're not allowed. Mm. You, you can only research on JW.org. Now, I've you actually encountered JW's where I said, you guys are told you're not supposed to research. It Doesn't that, doesn't that raise your eyebrows that you're not supposed And they told me, oh, no, we're encouraged to research. That's, I mean, at my door, that's what they told me. Um, and mm. I didn't argue with them about it because I'm not going to be like, you're a liar. Mm. Like, I just, but I, but it sounded to me like they're going, you guys can research if you want, but but here's what we think is wise. Is it, is it, I mean, how do they present this? They would actually tell you, they would tell you don't ever put Jehovah's Witnesses into the search engine on Google. Yeah, never type that. Because you'll come up with an apostate website. Mm. And then they designed their own official website. And then that's why they direct everyone to the official website. So they would never put Jehovah's Witnesses into the search engine. Yeah. <clears throat> and I'll tell you, they spend money making sure that the that jw.org is what pops up oh, uh, yeah. you searches because yeah. you don't get up to the top without some some money yeah. getting spent they're, they really are making sure that they're they're on the top there but yeah i mean they, i mean i remember mm -hmm. not so long ago they did say to the brothers brothers you don't need to do all the research because mm -hmm. there are brothers of bethel mm -hmm. in new york that have done all the research for you, and it's on JW.org. So all you need to do is use that, and just trust the brothers have done the best research that they can for you. And they have, they have a, they actually have a thing called a, a research tool on their website or on the on a, a, a website attached to that particular website. But it's just called a research tool, so you really don't feel you need to go anywhere else because it's all been done for you. Yeah, it's all done yeah. for you. So what you see from that last clip is the um, the level of suspicion, the level of challenge that that there is because if you're raised as a JW and then you go to someone's door and they start telling you things that are that are against the Watchtower, against the governing body, against the New World Translation, then your suspicion's already up. You've been trained that these these are the deceits of the deceivers. You know this is this is what you're getting. This is why. Um, I've learned the hard way that even though I had a pamphlet written specifically for Jehovah's Witnesses, and I thought, when they give me their stuff, I'll give them this. Guess what? They don't take it. They won't take it. They will not take non-Watchtower material because they've been trained that this stuff is apostate. It's lies from Satan. I mean, it's it's like stuff you can't even look at or research. Um, th this, is, this is the bubble they're in. So they're in a thought bubble. They're in a social bubble. They're in a doctrinal bubble. Everything is controlled. Everything is restricted. And this makes your job really challenging. They're not going to believe your word when you say something bad about the Watchtower. They're not going to believe your word when you say something about the Greek and, and the New World Translation. They're not going to believe you. They're not going to take your, your pamphlets or read anything that you give them. So the question is, what can we do? I mean, how can we overcome this? This, this real control that there is in the life of the Jehovah's Witness. Uh, well, I, I have some some tips that I think will make the job a lot easier for you and give you some real focus, so you could be like a like a like a spear, you know, going in there to have a real impact um, rather than just throwing rocks. <laughs> so, uh, first thing, uh, have a heart of compassion. Uh, you need to have a heart of compassion. This this is really one of the main focuses of this video and several of the videos I have online about Jehovah's Witnesses is to give you a heart of loving compassion toward them, the deceived, the tricked, the fooled, those who are on their way down a dark path uh, of, of lies about Christ. And, um, and we need to have a heart of love and compassion for them to outreach to them. My next thing is this, is learn at least one truth. Learn at least one truth truth. What I'm saying is this, you, rather than try to learn everything, because it's impossible, well, for most of us, it's impossible. I'm allowed to research. I'm able to spend great amounts of time studying and reading and, and just researching things. You're most likely not. And so um, instead of learning everything about the Watchtower, because you could be like, oh, I'm going to learn about the New World Translation and the Greek scriptures. I, I want to learn about the uh, ancient uh, teachings of, of Russell, Charles Taze Russell, and uh, about his court case in New York. I want to study the false prophecies. I want to look into the teachings about shunning or about birthdays or about blood transfusions, or I want to study about the deity of Jesus Christ or Michael the Archangel. Okay, but slow down, right? Because this is just too much information. So my advice is this, learn one truth. 
at least one truth, one thing that you're like, this is the thing I'll talk about. I will learn it and I will learn it really well. And then I will approach when, when I talk to them, this will be my target issue. This will be the one thing I talk to them about. Um, because they're not going to take my literature. They're not going to believe my word. I need to use their literature. That's, that's the third thing. And I'm, I'm going to give you examples of how you can do this uh, today on this, on this video. So use their literature. Um, I will extensively quote from the new world translation when, which is the Jehovah's witness translation when I'm witnessing to JWs. I will. I will quote from the Watchtower. I will use their sources because then the suspicion and the sociological bubble they're in will not attack that source because that's that's a verified, trusted source. So use their sources if possible. Even though in places the New World Translation is a bad translation, if you're going to show them that, show them it out of their own translation. You know that that's the point. Learn one truth. Use their literature, and one of the most important things is control the conversation. Control the conversation because. Uh, what will happen is you'll bring up an issue, and I guarantee it, a gut reaction, the Jehovah's Witness you're witnessing too, that they will they will immediately change the subject and go, oh yeah, well, what about Colossians 1? Oh yeah, well, what about, and they'll jump to another passage, but you pause them there and you say, hold on, this is important. You say, can we talk about this passage first? Can we just talk about this one first? Since we've already brought it up, can we finish this on this passage before we move to a different passage? Control the conversation. You you will you will rue the day you ignore this advice with Jehovah's Witnesses because by the end of a conversation, right, where you have brought up um, twenty different really good points and they went to twenty different scriptures and then bounced to twenty new ones, at the end of that conversation, neither of you remembers what you talked about. And it wasn't really impactful or effective. And you didn't get past the brainwashing of the watchtower because the brainwashing is, you know, it's generally kind of thin, right? But you have to stick to a topic to dig through it. That's that's the point. You got to control the conversation. So this next clip uh, I want to share with you guys is, I think, really important. It's um, it's really how do you how do you get a Jehovah's Witness to start doubting? the watchtower and start opening their eyes to the truth. And this is the advice received from uh, Simon and Maria because of their experience. So let's listen in. You know, when, the thing is, is, is once you learn one truth, just you only need to learn one. That it's like removing a card from a house of cards. You only need to move one and the whole lot come down. And once you can prove something you really believe is true, isn't true, and you know it, it's fact, and you've looked in the scriptures, you've, you've looked at that, studied that, and you said, this is not true, mm -hmm. then it questions everything else. Mm -hmm. And so you start to question everything else, and that's what I did, and I was writing scriptures down, I was doing study, I was looking, I've got different Bibles, I was on Bible Hub, and I was got yeah. a concordance, strong yeah. concordance, and we yeah. just have some research and realized it's not true. Mm -hmm. it isn't. This is absolutely golden, golden information you've received here. One truth. This is why you can just pick one topic and learn it. You know, learn it, but learn it deeply. Master the one issue you want to deal with. If you want to talk about the New World Translation, master that topic. So here's how you master it, right? You you, you learn the, the case you have against the Jehovah's Witness teaching in that particular area, whether it's prophecy or whatever. I'll give, give you some ideas of what to use in a second. So you learn the case against it. Then you have to learn what they say to you about it. Then you have to learn what you say to them about that. Then you have to learn what they say to you. So the conversation goes this way. Hey, I want to bring up Colossians 1. And I know what I'm going to say about it. I know what you're going to say about it. I know how I'll respond. And then I know what you'll say. And I know what I'll say to that. you got to learn at least four layers of the conversation, right? In chess, you got to think ahead. In, this is chess. And you got to think way ahead. So by picking one issue and going deep into that issue, into that passage, into the into the parallel passage, into different translations, into the way it is in the Old and the New Testament here, and, and, and then... When you encounter the JW, you hear how they challenge your objections and you write that down. If you fail to be able to like answer their objection in that conversation, you write it down and you go, here's the objection. Because guess what? That same objection will come up again next time you talk to a witness. So you write it down, you study it, and you're better prepared because you are mastering one topic. That's what you got to do. Master one topic. So here are some possible tactics that you can use, uh, directions you can go with this, this, um, this plan I've got for you. Possible tactics. Uh, one is false prophecy. Uh, you can actually target false prophecy. I'll get into this a little bit more in a minute. Um, and, and generally speaking, I think false prophecy is 
Um, you generally done in a way that doesn't help Jehovah's Witnesses, but I'll explain how I think it can be done in a way that might actually help. Um, also, number two, here's a different angle you might go, um, is the New World Translation uh, the case for the identity of Christ. What I mean is you use their translation, the new world, uh, in your in your attempt to demonstrate the deity of Jesus. So you're not using a different translation. Um, they'll, they will allow you to go to a different translation, but I don't recommend it. I think you should go through their translation. The nice thing about number two is you're not only giving them a good reason to doubt the watchtower, you're undoing some of the brainwashing, hopefully God willing, but you're, it's like an all-in-one because you're also pointing them to the truth of who Jesus is. So you're not just tearing something down, you're building something up. So personally, I really like number two. But what can also be effective is just targeting issues that matter to them. Suppose in your conversation with this witness, you find out that um, they, they are bothered by the idea that they can't celebrate birthdays or, um, or blood transfusions. That issue confuses them. And that happens to be something you know a good amount about. You know, you've targeted that issue. Then, then that's, that's worth doing. To be honest, blood transfusions, birthdays, I've, I've ignored that stuff, at least originally ignored those things because I thought, eh, what's the point? But they go to prove the unreliable and irrational nature of the governing body and their teachings. So it can be very useful in just being the one thing, because here, here's what happens. You put a crack in the dam. That, that's what happened with Simon and Maria, right? Simon, one thing caused him to go, Maybe it's not true. And that that little one issue that put a crack in the dam and then the floodgates came because then he went on his own and he studied and researched and he didn't rest until he got answers for his questions. And now they're followers of Jesus and they're part of a, of a, of a fellowship of, of real Christianity. And, and uh, so their lives were changed, but it started with just one truth. So you're just, these are tactics. You have false prophecy, New World Translation, case for the uh, deity of Christ or the identity of Jesus. Or three, just target an issue that matters to them, uh, that seems close to their heart. That that's a smart way to do it as well. So let me give you an example, if I can, of the um, of the uh, prophecy stuff and how I think it's done wrong, and how it maybe can be done a little better. See, prophecy is often done like this, right? Oh, and and, and I have a video that does this. I don't think it's wrong to do it, but I'm just saying, in your personal witnessing, this may not be the best way to do it. Online's a little different. Putting a video out for large numbers of people. But anyways, here's an example. So I'm quoting all from Watchtower approved literature here. And I have a video that I'll put it in the description where I go over this in more detail. But um, in 1916, uh, the Watchtower published that the Bible chronology herein presented shows that the six great thousand year days beginning at, with Adam are ended and that the great seventh day, the thousand years of Christ's reign began in 1873, right? Because the JWs are an older group now that said that Jesus already came back, back in 1873, he already started. Um, then, then what happens is you can go through a slew of these. So I go, ah, and here's another false prophecy, 1918, 1922, in 1923, in 1925, oh, again in 1925, then in 1926, they said this, in 1931, and I can like, I could just keep going and going with these things. Here's my problem with this. Um, and I, like I said, I have a video that actually does all this, I'll put it in the video description if you want to hear that case. Here's the problem with this though. It's just, I think it's maybe TMI. It's too much information. So in that one-on-one -on -one encounter, when you want to give them quotes from all these sources, it's a little too much for them to take in and then they, it doesn't sink in, right? You know, the way I view it, it's like this. Imagine a rake, you hit the ground with a rake and it hits the ground. It doesn't go very deep because it hits it on so many points, but then the pickaxe, it's only got one point and it just goes deep into the ground. And that's what I want to do with the Jehovah's Witness. I want to stick to a narrower subject, narrow, narrower topic. So it goes deeper and has a greater impact. So here's how you can do that with prophecy. You just pick one prophecy. You just pick one date. I, actually, I'd say one date, not just one prophecy. So like, let, let's say, for instance, I pick the prophecy about the things that were going to happen. Here we go. In 1925. So... I look here in, in a published in 1918, uh, a, a book many of the JWs will be familiar with, that millions now living will never die. And it says, let me give you the full view. Therefore, we may confidently expect that 1925 will mark the return, listen to this, the return of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and the faithful prophets of old, particularly those named by the apostle in Hebrews 11 to the condition of human perfection. So now... Let's suppose that this is your one thing. You're going to go get that Millions Now Living Will Never Die book, and you are going to do your best to actually get a physical copy. 
because a, a, a photocopy will, will vary. If you were Jehovah's Witness, you'd think this is probably deceit and you're not going to take it with you when you leave. You want to get a physical copy that says on it that it's printed by the watchtower. Is that easy to do? No. But since it's your one thing you're going to do, you're going to stick with that. So then I would do some research and I would say, I'll just pick the 1925 date. That would be my, re my recommendation if you're looking for one prophecy to use. Pick the 1925 date, go deep, deep into it, get as many original watchtower physical copies as you can get, even though it's hard to track them down and it might cost you some money, but it's worth it. Um, and then you're going to take them to those passages, show it to them with their own texts. And that is going to be like a pickaxe that goes down and has a much stronger impact. Um, so that's if you want to take the prophecy route. But suppose prophecy is not the thing that interests you as much. Um, there are some other things you can do. Um, you can you can do number two, like I said, the um, New World Translation case for the deity of Christ or for who Jesus is. So here's an actual conversation you can have. Are you ready? If you want to do this, you're going to want to write this down. You're going to go to Psalm 102, uh, verse 25 through 27 in the New World Translation. And it says this, and you're going to read it with the Jehovah's Witness right there in that conversation. It says, long ago, you laid the foundations of the earth and the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you will remain just like a garment. They will all wear out just like clothing. You will replace them and they will pass away. But you are the same and your years will never end. Okay, then you're going to ask this question of the, of the Jehovah's Witness. That passage we just read, it speaks about God's eternality, right? He's eternal. His years will never end. Question, would this be true of anyone other than Jehovah? Easy question, but you have to stop because in conversation, you have to let them answer. So you stop and you let them answer. I, I, I By the way, I got this from, uh, let, me, let me show this with you, from uh, uh, James White, who uh, I think is an excellent source for information on Jehovah's Witnesses. He wrote the following book right here, um, which is The Forgotten Trinity by, by James White. I highly recommend this book. It's, it's written from the perspective of a... Um, of, of someone who's done debates and witnesses, witnessing to Jehovah's Witnesses. So in other words, he knows the questions that JW will ask, and he's incorporated answers to those questions in his book. It's also not that big, <laughs> and it's, it's, it speaks very plainly and very scholarly as well. So I highly recommend it. Um, I'm going to put a link. I'm actually trying something new. I'm going to put a link in the video description here for this book uh, to get it from Amazon. This is an affiliate link. This is a way for me to uh, make a little bit of money to pay for the online community stuff I'm doing, pay for my website, pay for the YouTube stuff. Um, it doesn't cost you anything extra. So if you want to help support what I'm doing, you can click the affiliate link and get it through there. I'm looking for a way, ways to, um, be able to, 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 to be able to pay for my, my life <laughs> as well as expand the ministry financially open doors mon with money, but to do so in a way that never creates a paywall. Cause I never want a paywall between the ministry I put out and the people that it ministers to. I always want it to be utterly free. So that's a good way to do that. Um, I think we're trying it out, see how it goes. So the forgotten Trinity by James White, fantastic book, great resource. I recommend getting it. And the, um, the question you've asked them now was right. Would this be true of anyone other than Jehovah? And the answer is of course going to be no, no, of course not. Then you take them. So you're laying a trap and they know it too, but it's a good trap. <laughs> it's a trap of truth. You're going to take them then to Hebrews chapter one, verses 10 through 12, where it says, at the beginning, O Lord, you laid the foundations of the earth and the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you will remain. And just like a garment, they will all wear out and you will wrap them up just as a cloak, as a garment, and they will be changed. But you are the same and your years will never come to an end. Now, now's where the conversation is really going to begin. This is now going to start up uh, a real detailed <laughs> debate between these two passages, because the truth is the Hebrews one passage is quoting the Hebrews, uh, the, the Psalm 102 passage and Hebrews one in context is talking about the sun. And if they're going to, they're going to deny it. They're going to say, well, here, see, you anticipate their response. They'll say, it's not about Jesus. Hebrews one's not about Jesus. That's about Jehovah. And I'd say, well, it's both. It's about Jesus who is Jehovah, but let's read the passage then you patiently read the entire chapter and you see that before and after the verses of Hebrews 1, 10 through 12, before and after those verses, it's, and he says this about the son and he says this about the son. And so it's, it's definitely about Jesus in context. Um, in fact, JW.org helps you out in this situation because JW.org, which you want to use because that's their reliable source, JW.org, it links Psalm 102 and Hebrews chapter 1, verse 12. So you're going to want 
to show that even to the Jehovah's Witness. Remember, you're mastering just this one issue. So then they'll say, oh, it's just saying Jesus is exalted. And you're like, oh, no, except that it says that the attribute of Jesus is that he is, um, he's not only created, it's the work of his hands, but that he's the same and his years never come to an end. He's eternal. Eternality is, is, a, is, a, um, is an attribute that only exists with Jehovah. And this is what the Jehovah's Witness will agree with. So you're using what they already know to, to draw them to the truth of Jesus Christ. This is a, a fantastic uh, tactic to take, but you'll need to study it on your own. You'll need to master the passage, master it, and then be able to talk with them about it. Learn from any mistakes you make. And the real advanced uh, JW, the real knowledgeable one will say, in response to all this, they will say, oh, well, um, you know, the Hebrews passage isn't actually talking about, uh, about Jesus the way you think it is. And they'll say, ah, it, this, this is just saying that Jesus is like Jehovah in this one way. Um, you know, and, and Hebrews 1, eight talks about, it takes a passage that's applied to G, to David and applies it to Jesus. So that'll be their case, uh, you know, to present it this way. So you will hear this from the more informed Jehovah's Witness. The response to this is that while the passage itself, right, is is legitimately saying, yeah, it's, if it's true about Jehovah, this is also true about Jesus. The point though, is that the thing that's true about Jesus can only be true about Jehovah. The thing that's true about Jesus can only be true about Jehovah, the eternality. That that's an attribute that belongs to him and no one else. So there's one you can do. And then you can also ask them about another passage. Here's another idea. I'm going to give you a, two more real ideas or paths you might pick to follow and, and do some research on your own uh, to prepare for your own witnessing opportunities with Jehovah's Witnesses. So the next one is going to be uh, John chapter 12. In John 12, verses 37 through 41, we're going to read through this, and then we're going to ask a question about who this passage is talking about. So let's let's do that. And here's how, I'm going to do it with you the way I would do it with a Jehovah's Witness. Um, and again, this is this information is from James White. I think it's very well thought out and and tried and true territory. So I, I highly recommend it. Uh, so John chapter 12, verse 37 says, although he had performed so many signs before them, they were not putting faith in him. Notice I'm quoting from the New World Translation here. So that the word of Isaiah the prophet might be fulfilled, who said, Jehovah, who has put faith in the thing heard from us? And as for the arm of Jehovah, to whom has it been revealed? The reason they were not able to believe is that again, Isaiah said, he has blinded their eyes and has made their hearts hard so that they would not see with their eyes and understand with their hearts and turn around and I heal them. Now here's the most important verse. Often people don't notice this passage, this verse, because they're like so caught up by the passage, like God doesn't want them to understand. Um, but I deal with that elsewhere in other videos. So Isaiah, Isaiah, it says in verse 41, Isaiah said these things because quote, he saw his glory and he spoke about him. This is Jesus, right? Who is it that Isaiah is speaking about? Well, clearly Isaiah is speaking about Jesus in this passage. And you can now, now here's what you'll do is you'll then learn how to make a case for this, that Isaiah is about Jesus. Why? Because then when we go to who Isaiah saw, it'll, it'll all come together and you'll see this is all about Jesus being Jehovah. So the question you'll ask next is, who, whose glory did Isaiah see? Whose glory did Isaiah see? You see, in the first part of John, it quotes from Isaiah 53.1, which is a messianic passage. But then in the last part, it quotes from Isaiah chapter 6, where Isaiah saw somebody's glory. And we can read about whose glory Isaiah saw, because apparently, according to John, Isaiah saw Jesus' glory and spoke about Jesus. So let's read into it. Isaiah 6, 1 through 10, it says, and the year, I'm just going to read the whole passage because you need to get familiar with the whole passage. You need to study it and you need to be able to answer objections to it, it to do this witnessing. Isaiah 6, 1 through 10, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw Jehovah sitting on a, on a lofty and elevated throne and the skirts of his robe filled the temple. Seraphs were standing above him and each had six wings. Each covered his face with two and covered his feet with two and each of them would fly above with two. So the, the important thing here is I saw Jehovah, right? This is New World Translation. I saw Jehovah. Who did Isaiah see? Jehovah. Let's read on though because it'll get to the part John quoted. And one called to another, Holy, holy, holy is, Jeho is Jehovah of armies. The whole earth is filled with his glory and the pivots 
of the thresholds. By the way, that's the word glory. So we have the word see and the word glory. And in, uh, well, I won't get into the Greek today with you, but but um, but it, the, the Greek words, I'll put it this way. The Greek words in Isaiah match the Greek words used in John when it, when it uses see and glory. And it's the only place where we see it in that context in Isaiah. That would be in the Greek translation of Isaiah um, called the Septuagint. So the earth is filled with his glory and the pivots of the thresholds quivered at the sound of the shouting and the house was filled with smoke. Then I said, woe to me, I'm as good as dead. For I'm a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King Jehovah of armies himself. Isaiah saw him and spoke of him. And the him in John is Jesus. I see him. At that, one of the seraphs flew to me, and his, in his hand was a glowing coal that he had taken with tongs from the altar. He touched my mouth and said, look, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is removed and your sin is atoned for. Then I heard the voice of Jehovah saying, whom shall I send and who will go for us? And I said, here I am, send me. And he replied, go and say to this people. Now here's the part John quotes from Isaiah six. You will hear and understand, but will uh, you will hear and, and again, but you will not understand. You will see again and again, but you will not gain any knowledge. Make the heart of this people unreceptive, make their ears unresponsive and paste their eyes together so that they may not see with their eyes and hear with their ears so that their heart may not understand and they may not turn back and be healed. Okay, so this is this is the second possible passage you can go to, right? You, 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 you pair the John and Isaiah together. You show that John is quoting from Isaiah 6 and says that Isaiah saw Jesus's glory and spoke of Jesus quotes Isaiah 53, John quotes Isaiah 6, puts them together. And this is definitely Isaiah 6 being quoted. If they want to fight you on that, here's, and write this down, you're going to say, um, on John 1240, on jw.org, there's a footnote that takes you to Isaiah 610, meaning that jw.org supports the connection between John uh, 1240 and Isaiah 610. These two are connected on jw.org. Do you, you see the strategy here? You're using their material to try to avoid the, the suspicious attitude they have towards other people's stuff so that you can try to put a crack in the dam. Just put a crack in the dam. Give them something to think about. Who did Isaiah speak of? He spoke of Jesus. He spoke of Jehovah. He spoke of Jehovah, <laughs> who is Jesus. So this is about the identity of Christ. Now they're going to jump to another passage. They're going to change the subject. They'll move on to some other issue. But I, I, I'm telling you, please, please don't let them yet. Say, let's finish the discussion on these passages and their connection before we're able to go somewhere else. And then even in the conversation, if you have to, because you're just trying to put something in their heart that has them start to open their eyes to see the truth of Christ. So I have one other angle you can take, and this is for those who are more interested in the Greek. You don't need to know Greek to do this, but if it's your interest then uh, here's an angle to take if you want to talk about the New World Translation and how to demonstrate that there's a problem with it. So here we go. Question. Here's the question you're going to ask. You should write this down. What would it mean if the word other was not in Colossians 1, verses 16 and 17? That's the question you'll ask them. And then uh, I'll, I'll just put it up, a screenshot of the New World Translation, this exact passage in the New World Translation. So Isaiah, or Colossians 1, 16, 17, here's the actual passage. Let me read it to you. And I'm going to emphasize the word other. And the question is, what would it mean if this word wasn't there? What would that imply? So he rescued us from the authority of darkness. Actually, I'll skip ahead to verse 15. Speaking of Jesus, clearly the passage is about Jesus, and they'll agree with you here. Um, so he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation, verse 16, because by means of him, all other things were created in the heavens and on the earth, the things visible and the things invisible, whether they are thrones or lordships or governments or authorities, all other things have been created through him and for him. Also, he is before all other things and by means of him, all other things were made to exist. He is the head of the body, the congregation. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead so that he might become the one who is first in all things because God was pleased to have fullness, all fullness dwell in him and through him to reconcile to himself all other things. So the word other in those verses, especially verses 16 and 17, the word other is added in the Watchtower's New World Translation. Um, now, now I already told you they're not going to trust you when you say that. 
So I have a way for you to show them that using only watchtower literature. So here's the plan, right? You first, you have to lay the, lay the bait out. You got to say, what would it mean if the word other wasn't there? And it would mean that, well, by means of him, all things were created. Um, all things have been created through him and for him. He's before all things. And by means of him, all things were made to exist. That would mean that Jesus is uncreated. That's what it would mean. Now, you, you will have to labor with them on this point. They're not just going to readily accept that, that that would mean Jesus is created because that's like anathema to them, right? This is blasphemy to them. But you have to belabor the point. You've got to, you've got to just push it and push it a little bit and, and round it out and have the discussion. Learn how to have that conversation with them. Then after they've got, you've got them to the point where they'll go, okay, okay, if, if the word other wasn't there, it would mean Jesus was definitely not created. And on a side note, even if the word other was there, it wouldn't mean Jesus was created actually. It would, it would be consistent with either Jesus never being created or Jesus having been created. It would be, it would be able to go either way. The passage would become very flexible with the word other there, but without the word there, it's completely inflexible. Jesus is definitely not created. Um, you can also go to uh, John chapter one, verse three to fully support this in the new world translation that Jesus is the, is uncreated. Um, but let's stick to Colossians one, right? We want to try to stick to topic. So here's what you're going to do next. You're going to take him to this. Uh, what is this? Well, <laughs> let me, let me explain. Um, this, this is a screenshot from the watchtower produced interlinear translation, the KIT, the kingdom interlinear translation of the Christian Greek scriptures is what they would consider it. So this, um, this book, it has on one column, it has, uh, the English and then over here, uh, I'm sorry, next to the English, it'll have the Greek and then it'll put the English words directly over the Greek words. So let me take you to that screenshot again, directly under the Greek words. So here we have, um, we have the underlined in the uh, in the translation. Let me get rid of my face here for a second. In the translation, you've got the, which is the New World Translation. That's on the right side of your screen, and that has in verse sixteen, right? Because by means of him, all other things were created. Notice the brackets. There's brackets in this translation because for a season the Watchtower put brackets in this passage. Then they took the brackets away because brackets were, are used typically by translators to indicate we've added this word. We've added this word. So now you're showing them a watchtower produced piece of literature, the Kingdom Inter Interlinear Translation. I'll put a link to that in the video description as well. Uh, it's the same as I did for the Forgotten Trinity. Um, I'm gonna try to do an affiliate link. We'll see if I can do that. Now, the, the thing here is, if you get a copy of this, you can actually bring this out and, and the page I'm about to walk you through and show you, you can show it to them yourself. That's why I have this. It's about, I don't know if it's like 30, 40 bucks online, but it is online, at least at the moment on Amazon, you can find it totally worth it. I brought this out. I've showed in the passage and the, and the last two times I've done this, uh, when I've encountered JWs, both times I felt as though it was effective to at least get them started thinking about things. I remember them, one guy flipping back to the beginning of the book to make sure, is this really watchtower produced? Why? Because he wanted to doubt it. He was going to dismiss it if it wasn't printed by the watchtower. But when he opened it up to the front page, he saw that it was, in fact, their material. You got to use their material. So um, here's the passage now. The, the interlinear, what they do is they put the Greek on one side and then they spread out the verse so they can show you here's the Greek word above and then there's the word below that we translated it into. Now, wherever the word all is, where it says all and in parentheses, things, um, notice that the word other is nowhere on the left side of the page. It's just completely not there. The reason why it's not there is because the word other is added in Colossians 1 by the Watchtower's Bible and Tract Society Translating Committee, the anonymous translators who they, who they wouldn't reveal. Um, they've added the word other because they want Jesus to be a created being. So you're going to show them how in the Greek, the word other appears nowhere on that other side of the page. That's that word panta. And that's how it's pronounced panta in the Greek, uh, the P alpha, nu tau alpha. That's that word right there. And it appears one, two, three, four times we see. And every time it appears, it's without the word other. There's a couple different words in Greek for other, and neither of them appear in that passage. So, so this is something you can actually take and you can share it with a layman. You can, you know, it's meant to be usable by someone who doesn't know Greek. And I think that's a neat uh, angle to take. So you can master that topic as well. 
So what you're doing is you're picking an issue, you know, and maybe your issue is into being blood transfusions or birthdays or something like that, but master the issue. Try it out on a Jehovah's Witness. If they counter you, and if it ends up being a terrible experience, you write that down and you go, what do I need to learn to do this better next time? And you make yourself better at driving in a pick, a pickaxe, metaphorically, <laughs> into the dam to get a crack in the wall so that it might begin to get them researching. Because if they will just go home and just Google if they will just go and begin to research, if they'll just start to look at things a little bit more critically, they will absolutely come out of the watchtower. And um, and we owe it. We owe it to them to, to love them. Oh no, oh, no one anything except to love one another, right? We owe them love and compassion to outreach to them. When, when the Jehovah's Witness knocks on my door, it's my chance to knock on their door. When they come to my house, it's my chance to reach them with the truth of Christ. I'm not looking for snarky, mean things to say to them. I'm not attacking them because I'm so hateful and against them. I want to draw them out of the deception and lies of the watchtower so that they might know the truth of the grace of Jesus Christ. Now, <clears throat> moving forward uh, in future videos, I plan on doing this more. I gave a quick overview of a few things you could take, but I'll pick one issue, like the, the New World Translation, and I will unpack that in great detail. I will pick one issue, like Jesus being identified as Jehovah, and I'll unpack it in more detail, answering even more objections, training you to do this stuff even better, to outreach to Jehovah's Witnesses and even other groups who have similar uh, heretical teachings, uh, so that we could be the light of the world, not just the right of the world. <laughs> All right. So Lord bless you guys. Uh, it's been great doing this video. I hope you find it to be a, a tremendous help to you.